I'm here to share the work that was done in Cheshire. Um, I was formerly development management archaeologist for Cheshire along with Mark Lear. And this work is mainly thanks to Mark Lear. I'm just here as a spokesperson for what we did. Um, it's just specifically related to Cheshire that I'm talking about, but it's just the lessons that we learn from the approaches that we've taken, the positives and the negatives. So since 2010, APAS um, have required archaeological contractors with the support of local metal detecting clubs to undertake structured supervised surveys to investigate the potential of sites subject to client applications. Now the reasons for commissioning some reports varies. On a lot of cases the desk based assessments and historical mapping have showed that there's nothing on the site. But as you all know, um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, and there are some sites, particularly with the case study I'm going to be looking at, where they are located close to the historic cores of towns or there is documentary evidence to say that something happened there but there's no actual proof of it. So if there is potential, we would try, where possible, to um, put one of these surveys in as a condition to a planning application. The approach has been used effectively on a number of sites, in some cases allowing the identification of particular locations which may require further investigation or concluding that the archaeological potential of an area has been addressed by the recovery and analysis of the process of assemblage. However, APAS have continually been challenged by developers, um, planning colleagues and archaeological consultants and on occasion archaeological contractors on the validity of this approach. Um, and as a result, in 2017, we commissioned Dr Rob Philpott to do an academic review of the approach so that we then had something when questioned about the use of this we could then show this to them and say it's been reviewed, it's valid. So in this paper I'm just going to share the work that we've been doing. So why use metal detector surveys? The identification of archaeological sites in rural Cheshire in common with much of lower and northwest England poses particular problems due to the ephemeral nature of deposits scarcity of artefactual material and the masking effect of predominantly pasture landscape. Alongside the usual range of approaches such as trail trenching, field walking and geophysical survey, a number of other approaches have been utilised over the past few years which are designed to address the problem of site recognition and definition in a way that is both credible and reasonable in planning terms. One such method is supervised metal detector surveys. Ferrous and non-ferrous um, metalwork can be as scarce on archaeological sites in Cheshire as other classes of artefactual material. However, the Portable Antiquities Scheme has demonstrated that significant material is present in plough soil and on occasion it's clear that concentrations of material are indicative of more significant below ground remains. Therefore, structured supervised metal detectors may have a role to play in the location of such archaeological sites either alongside other techniques as discussed above or on their own. So the aims and objectives of the surveys that have been undertaken in Cheshire. Primary aim is to provide information about the archaeological resource of a given site, including the presence and absence of artefacts, character, extent, date, integrity, state of preservation and significance of any artefacts that have been found. Some surveys will have more specific aims relating to previous discoveries in the vicinity of a site or other evidence of archaeological potential. So that should be results of previous archaeological investigations on neighbouring sites. Um, the surveys also provide a much more comprehensive overview of the quantity, type and date of material uh, metal finds recovered from fields than routinely recorded by Portable Antiquity Scheme. In contrast to the inevitable selectivity of the PASS approach, the surveys undertaken in Cheshire aim to record all metal finds, obviously excluding modern junk, cans, things like that. Um, the objective of this is to provide a complete record of the metalwork assemblage, quantified by date and type and accurately plotted within the landscape, um, which can serve as repositories of fine-grained information on local land use, agricultural practices and the social and economic status of local communities. So, who's involved? Initially, um, if the site is selected for such a survey and APAS is considering it suitable, um, in their condition that's attached to the plan application or in their uh, predetermination um, consultation recommendations, APAS will always stipulate that where such work is carried out, it should be undertaken by suitably experienced individuals operating under direct archaeological supervision. 
individuals involved will also need to have signed a form waiving any claim to reward under the Treasure Act. The role of APAS, once the, the work has been um, conditioned, they will then instruct the developer or the landowner to um, appoint an archaeological contractor. We can't give specific recommendations on contractors, so we refer them to the Badger or the CEFA lists. Um, usually, they go for the most local or the cheapest, as expected. Um, once appointed, the archaeological contractor will then make contact with a metal detectors club. Usually, it's the most local club. Um, if it's a contractor that has previous experiences of doing such work, they tend to stick to the same club. Um, and then following a joint site visit between the metal detectives and the contractor, a written scheme of um, investigation is produced, sent to WAPAS for approval, and then once that approval has been issued, the work can then commence. So the methodology, as just said, the first and most important aspect um, of the process is to produce um, the, de the written scheme of investigation, which sets out the methodology for the survey and also the legislation policy and guidance that will be used. So for instance, um, in these kind of um, work, it's the Treasure Act, Historic England guidelines on both survey and metal detecting, and then see for guidelines. Um, once it happens, the surveys tend to vary from site to site. It, it depends on the conditions, but as a general rule, um, a transect interval of 10 metres is adopted on most surveys, which matches common practice in extensive field walking. Uh, this ensures an approximate 10% sample coverage of the ground surface and transects laid out using GPS marked with temporary markers and metal detecting is undertaken along each transect, um, allowing for approximate 30% overlap in order to produce consistent sample. Each suite one metre either side of the transect. Um, any material located is then um, recorded by the supervising archaeologist and is usually uh, recorded by GPS at an appropriate level of accuracy. Um, once the survey is completed, um, a report will then be produced by the archaeological contractor which will outline the results of the metal detector survey and includes an interpretation of the results in light of the archaeological and historical background of the site. So, one example where this approach has been really successful is Congress Road in Sandbach. Um, in June 2015, Lord Alarm from Archaeology were commissioned to undertake a metal detecting survey on the land um, prior to its proposed redevelopment for housing. So you can see on the map above um, and the first edition ordnance survey, other than the field boundaries changing, it's it's pretty much the same. There's no indication on the maps that there was any um, activity. A DBA was produced for the site and it summarises the site's potential as follows. Prehistoric and Roman archaeological remains are virtually absent within the vicinity of the site. Uh, the historic core of the town is known to have Saxon origins, evident by crosses and workstone fragments within the graveyard of St Mary's. Iron spots recorded on the Portable Antiquity Scheme largely comprise artefacts of post medieval date, some relating to industrial activity such as the malt, um, liquor industry, and the yarn industries, which flourished during the 16th and 17th centuries. However, given the proximity of the site to the historic core of uh, Southbarge and also the area of archaeological potential, which is recorded um, on the Cheshire Historic Environment Record, APAS requested um, a program of predetermination archaeological investigation with the purpose of establishing if there was need for further investigation. It was such a large site, so close to the historic core, um, we thought that there was potential for something to come up and the most suitable form of investigation to assess this was the Metal Detecting Survey. So, the survey was undertaken over a period of eight days and encompassed an area of 7.89 hectares. Um, and it was conducted by Ward Armstrong with the support of metal detectorists from the Historical Research Society. A total of 226 metal and ceramic finds were recovered during the survey, and the artifacts ranged in date from the Roman period through to the uh, post medieval period. So, Roman period, there were coins, um, rivets, there's an arm of a bronze statue. Uh, medieval, um, it was mainly spindle whorls and um, buckles, um, and then for the post-medieval finds, again, buckles, buttons, there was a hawk whistle, um, hot legs of indeterminate date, um, and they, they represented the largest collection of finds from the site. So, um, all of the results uh, were plotted 
and this is the map, as you can see, um, with the key, I'm not sure if you can see, it's quite small, of um, where the, the finds were located. What that tells us is that the western half of the site seems to have a concentration of Romano-British um, and medieval um, finds, which is indicative that maybe, maybe that there is something going on in that area. So the recovery of the Roman and medieval artefacts within the western half of the site um, was considered of high archaeological potential. Um, there's very little evidence of Roman activity within the town of Sandbach, despite a Roman road running quite close to the town. Um, so therefore, um, these finds were, were considered significant. Um, musket balls were also recovered and considered significant, although there was no spatial distribution pattern for these. Um, and the recovery of the 17th and 18th century finds were of interest as well, as they provide evidence of domestic activity on the site uh, from these periods, which is not depicted on the mapping or mentioned in the desk-based assessment. So, as a result, um, it was decided that prior to um, development work beginning, that a programme of archaeological investigation was needed to target those areas on the western part of the site where concentrations of Roman remains were found. Um, this was done over a 30 day period um, and they chose to strip and record areas where buildings were going to be or um, services. So there was 18 sites in, possible, uh, in total and as you can see from that map that's a plot. Um, what the watching brief confirmed is the presence of previously unknown Romano-British remains. The remains comprised of enclosure ditches and some possible limited evidence of structures. Uh, there were the possible remains of a sheep race, which indicated a local economy which included animal husbandry, as did the environmental evidence from the ditches. Uh, the relatively small quantity of Romano British artefacts from the survey would suggest that the main focus of the settlement was elsewhere. The overall survey results show that there is a good correlation between the absence of medieval or earlier metal finds and the absence of archaeological features which can, which can be reliably dated to the same broad period. However, an important exception was a small number of undated features. Although it's difficult to assess their significance, it is precisely features such as these that will represent the archaeology of periods which lack metal and ceramic finds. So these are the early prehistoric periods. It might be argued that they merit further careful investigation and should not be dismissed too readily. So, because of the challenges that we constantly faced as a planning archaeologist, um, on occasions we have been accused of punishing developers that um, we can't think of anything else to do so we're, we're asking for metal detecting surveys just to annoy them. Uh, we've had them go on site and not do them and start building works and we've had to get um, planning enforcement officers in to stop them so the surveys can be done. So one of the things that APAS do is they are quite good at any new approaches that they use they get them peer reviewed and once a year we try to get peer reviewed with one of the new techniques we used and in 2017 we decided to look at metal detecting surveys just so that we had something when questioned on the approach that we could say it you know it works and if if the results came back that it didn't work then we'd stop requesting them but it was to justify the approach so dr rob philpot was um, commissioned to undertake the work um, and in total, 25 surveys were examined with the aim of assessing their effectiveness and to examine the circumstances which affected the success of the methodology. Um, Rob considered the chronological and functional profiles of finds from surveys, uh, discussed the reasons for the formation of the metalwork assemblages that predominate in the county, and also considered issues such as the question of iron in archaeological surveys and finds retention. Um, and his article was published in the Journal of Chester Archaeological Society. Um, and it's, if you want to take notes of where it is, that's. So, what did Rob come up with? The positives of the approach. So, metal detecting has certain advantages over other field techniques. Unlike field walking, it's not impeded by core ground visibility. It's not dependent um, upon an expert eye of a field walker. Um, and it's not limited to surface remains. And also, unlike geophysical survey, it provides material diagnostic of date. Um, on heavily ploughed sites, metal finds and other plough zone material may represent the only surviving component of the archaeological site, therefore it's important to record these. Um, although current archaeological research themes do not place high value on mass-produced 
18th century or later metalwork assemblages. This kind of material, when systematically collected and spatially recorded, has value in informing a record of past land use activities, such as agricultural practices, manuring regimes and livestock management. Um, as academic interests and research directions change, it's anticipated that metal detecting assemblages will provide worthwhile data for future study. This is something that's become evident in the recent update to the Northwest Regional Research Framework. One of the things highlighted is that not enough research is done on post medieval finds assemblages. Now, they were referencing this to ceramics, but I think metalwork comes into this as well, and it's something that definitely needs looking at, particularly in the Northwest because the vast amount of metalwork finds are of that period, and they do have use. Uh, one of the things that Rob wrote in his um, review, which I'll just read out, is the assemblages of small metal items and coins also preserve evidence of growing consumerism, the spread of fashion and social display, through changing styles of buttons and other personal items, um, and as such varied social practices as the use of love tokens. Recreational shooting and coin use that are otherwise very largely undocumented at a local level. But aside from the, academical, uh, the academic positives, there's also another thing that's come out of these surveys. Um, there's a positive working relationship between metal detectorists and archaeologists and encouragement of, aware, of awareness of the understanding of value of finds in their spatial context. So not just the monetary value of finds, but their value where they were found. Um, and this is something that's become quite evident that most of the people that we use on these surveys, they now, with the um, kind of growing um, kind of addition of downloadable data onto phones and iPads, they can now go out when they're doing their surveys, their own surveys, they can now go out and when they find things, they can, um, on their iPhone, they can plot them, there's forms that they can fill in and they can then download this data as GPX file and send it to the HER and it gets uploaded onto the HER, so it's great for us, we encourage it. But also, in addition, um, you know, it, we need to, to kind of you know, credit the metal detectorists um, and also their expertise and local knowledge. You know, a lot of the fields that they've been surveying, the archaeologists wouldn't necessarily know something about them, but they're familiar with the kind of finds and they can identify things. So it's a real knowledge share. The negatives that came out. Only a small proportion of the sites which produce significant groups of Roman or medieval finds um, were followed by further field investigation. This is obviously crucial to assessing the reliability of the approach. Although the correlation and of the absence of medieval and early finds in metal detecting with similar absence in field evaluation may appear to suggest that surveys are accurately reflecting the archaeological potential, the biases identified above strongly indicate that such assumptions cannot be accepted without testing. There is a problem with this. In commercial-led archaeology, developed from the archaeology, it's very hard to secure that post-survey work. In an ideal world, we would be able to do it, but it's not always possible. So maybe the reverse could be looked at, that if metal detectorists are doing their own surveys and they are keeping really, really good records of what they're doing um, and the spatial context of their finds, then if a dig happens because a development is coming on, that data can then be used in advance. So, so I think maybe we should look at it that way around. Um, Another point was no consideration was given to previous detecting which may have removed without record the majority of the finds from a site and may skew results. Um, efforts should therefore be made uh, through inquiries within the metal detecting community um, and landowners to determine whether sites have been previously de uh, detected um, and also see if access to any data that's been recorded can be looked at. Um, also, the different attitude towards the recovery of iron raises a, few, a number of questions, which Rob goes into detail. I won't talk about it now because I've got one minute, uh, but read Rob's article. So, things to consider. Um, most survey reports have recommended retaining only a small selection of items in the archive, usually 10%. Given the pressure on stores in the Cheshire area, a retention policy should be built up. Um, given the potential academic value, a strong case for creating a photographic record of those finds that, that have been discarded. Uh, particular importance is high quality records made of uncertain or unidentified finds or of finds where potential date range is wide. Uh, this will enable finds to be re-examined um, and potentially identified at a later date. Um, 
Another way to consider the effectiveness of the metal detector surveys is to look at how the growing evidence finds distribution both by period and region and to assess how effective systematic metal detecting is likely to be in finding sites of those periods. One question might be, uh, do Cheshire sites produce sufficient metal work to make it likely that they will be identifiable for metal detecting alone? Uh, and a related question is how many finds constitute a significant assemblage or site? So conclusions. Hopefully, what I've showed is that you sensitively and with a keen awareness of the limitations and potential bias, metal detecting survey is an important weapon in the armoury of archaeologists seeking to establish archaeological significance of land in commercial development. Sorry, it's really rude.